Interpreters need higher quality sound than the ordinary listener. And of course, you are going to ask why, if you are the owner of a platform or the organizer of an event, or maybe a sound technician, you're thinking, I can hear it. It's sound, I can hear it, it's fine, I, I can understand. And I'm going to tell you why what sounds fine to other people is not good enough for interpreters. First, and I'm going back to this idea of ISO compliant. You need to have ISO compliant sound. These standards are the ones that interpreters need for simultaneous interpretation. So again, why? I'm going to put myself in your shoes. You're thinking, hmm, are these people spoiled or what? Well, I'm going to tell you about two categories, auditory and cognitive, where uh, interpreters face special um, special obstacles specific to what they are trying to do. The first one is auditory, and that is the fact that you must hear above your own voice because we are speaking and listening at the same time. And believe me, we are also listening to our own voice. So we have these two inputs, our own voice and whatever is coming through our headset. And we need particularly good quality to separate them out. Let me give you a little example. If I, if let's say a speaker has raise the volume of her speech because she really wants to emphasize a point. And I am going to be interpreting that part of the speech, you know, seven or eight, ten seconds later. And let's say that I decide, I don't have to do this, but I might decide, I am also going to use higher volume to emphasize a point. And so I am starting to speak into my microphone at a higher volume to emphasize this point, but she's already moved on to the part where she wants to contrast with what she just said, what she said at high volume. So she's saying something very quietly. Now I have to hear that very quiet thing above my own voice, which has, in order to get the message across, has adopted a higher level of volume. So you can see how this interplay of two sound inputs is problematic and we do need higher quality sound because of that. So that's the first reason. It has to do with the sound that we are getting. We are getting two sounds, two in, uh, sound feeds. Secondly, uh, and then there are two in this category, actually three, cognitive. Our mind is divided into three. The ordinary listener is pretty much s sitting there and uh, trying to just follow and of course, yes, analyzing and seeing what is pertinent, etc. But the main idea is just to take in what is being said. However, the interpreter has their brain power, their cognitive load is divided over three areas. First of all, the interpreter is figuring out what on earth the person is trying to say. Now, this is really what we do. This is very sometimes extraordinarily difficult. Uh, maybe you have ha had a hard time finding out what I'm trying to say sometimes. And it's, it's just part of life, especially when someone is a high level speaker and is explaining something that is important. It requires a lot of concentration, but I'm going to show you a little case where it's actually not all that complicated. Uh, this man made a video where he uh, has, a, it's a joke where he says, under the pandemic, we will replace all uh, explosive consonants like P with F so that the uh, the pandemic doesn't get spread by our uh, our uh, spitting out little bits of, of virus. And it's sort of a joke. And I'll have you listen now. I hope you can hear it. Okay. Anyone speaking to other people in a public place will have to stop using the flosive sound. Failure to do so could lead to a fine or even prison. Okay, let's just take the end there. He says, failure to do so could lead to a fine or even prison. Well, all of us understand that it means prison. How do we understand that? Because we are thinking, we're dedicating some attention to that, figuring out what is going on. And when uh, the sound is a little bit off, 
we dedicate more brain power to figuring out, okay, he said prison, but he means prison. Same thing here, look at this, number one, let's say that somebody says, let's have lunch at, one, at 12.30 a.m. Again, I'm thinking, well, I don't think she means let's have it in the middle of the night. So, okay, she just mis misspoke, I understand. This takes some brain power. So there really is a lot of uh, cognitive load in figuring out what the person says. Number two, formulating good output in the target language. Of course, this is what you get to hear the interpreter saying. And uh, this is really hard. Have you ever tried doing this? You have to say what the person said and keep listening to what happens later. And of course, this takes many years. When I went to interpreting school, it was after I had my master's degree and almost everybody else in interpreting school had already attained their master's degree. And it was really, and we just worked on how to be an interpreter for a couple of years. It's, it's not easy. So we here are, have this second task of, of how, figuring out how to say what the person said in another language. Thirdly, we have to monitor what we say, just like I am monitoring what I say right now. If I say something off, which I have, it, I think, I just correct it. Well, uh, interpreters are also listening. Hey, did I say what I meant to say? What they heard is that actually communicating what the speaker said. This monitoring is going on all the time. So that's a third cognitive task that the interpreter is doing and that the ordinary listener is not doing. So here we have all four uh, summed up. The first one is auditory. You have to hear above your own voice. Number two, figuring out what the meaning of the speech is. Thirdly, expressing that meaning faithfully. And believe me, we are bending over backwards always to do that. And, and sometimes we do stupid things like turn up the volume in order to do that, that when there's bad sound. And number four, monitor, make sure that what we're saying is working. So what happens when the sound is poor? Well, you will get poor output from the interpreter. We will not be able, in spite of all of our efforts, to pro provide the best quality that we always like to provide. But I'm also going to dig in a little bit on this second point, acoustic shock and related health issues. These problems have become a bit of an epidemic during the pandemic because remote has tripled the rate of um, injury to interpreters while they work. And here's my little image. I know an interpreter who said that she experienced uh, an acoustic shock and now she always has to ask her husband, are those actual bells ringing or is it just ringing in my ears? That's pretty serious. Here we have a very recent uh, report, only a few days ago, from Canada. And you can use that QR code and <clears throat> take a look at it. But I've taken the care to pull out a few pieces since the pandemic started, have you been injured at work while doing remote simultaneous interpre interpreting? Almost three quarters say yes. Have you fully recovered from your injuries? Almost half say no. There's another piece of a, uh, a statistic, which is uh, something that I uh, did not <clears throat> copy for you, but it says that um, the rate and I, I said it earlier, actually, the rate of injury has tripled ever since the uh, March last year because of remote. You're probably asking why. Remember I said I would try to put myself in your shoes. Well, the reason that people in interpreters get injured is that there may be very loud noises coming out that are explosive. And sometimes the reason for this is that the interpreter cannot get good quality sound and does something that we should never do, but we may do uh, in spite of that, because we are trying so hard to deliver the message to you, they turn up the volume and then a big a feedback comes or something and that creates an injury. But there's also the fact that extended exposure to sound, which has been degraded, as I said, 
none of the platforms have ISO compliant sound. So if you have sound that's been degraded by its passage from me to you over a system, that is over the long term will uh, cause injury. I, there is a website that I, uh, page that I created, you can see it here, it's called Save Your Ears and uh, that's the address and there is the QR code. It's full of studies about this and it includes the study I just showed you. So um, please help interpreters to provide accurate, faithful and beautiful interpretation. This is what we love to do. <clears throat> but also help us to avoid pain, constantly ringing and hissing ears, headaches, uh, loss of hearing, and some have even had loss of balance and things like that. And I can tell you that I have had a loss of hearing and I have ringing in my ears. Uh, can't say that it was due to interpreting, but uh, certainly it was a contributing factor. Speakers, when I said participants earlier, I meant anybody who's uh, taking the microphone. Use a good headset with a good quality microphone. Use cable rather than Wi-Fi. Have a stable camera, not a, a phone that's shaking about, and make sure that you're in some place that is quiet. So far, I haven't had a dog or anybody run in here today. Why? Because I planned. I planned for that. Well, let's plan. Platforms, you need to up your game and give us ISO standards of sound. Conference organizers, Demand the above of all your service providers, in particular, that the speakers take care and that they have good mic microphones. Send them a microphone using uh, all the mini services, the way we're always getting everything now, Amazon or whatever, I don't have stock in Amazon, but, and, and demand that all of your uh, speakers have a good microphone and that they, uh, if it's a platform that they have good sound interpreters insist on good sound it's a matter of your hearing and your livelihood and secondly keep your volume as low as christopher thierry told me back in 1983 told the whole class keep your volume always at the lowest level you can which still enables you to capture the entire message so here we have covered all of these uh, seven points and i think that uh, if I hope that I have helped you to have a successful multilingual event, and I hope that I have helped you to help us to give you a very successful multilingual event. And so that is the end of my talk. Thank you.